Hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining in this uh, late session of the day. Uh, I'll try making it a bit uh, entertaining for everyone. And we'll start with something interesting from last week. Last week, uh, Java and Scala de developers, programmers, woke up to this announcement. As soon as my clicker works with my computer, I can even show you that. Okay. Okay, this one. Uh, Lightband change is changing the license of Akka from Apache 2.0 to a non-open source license, specifically to BSL, business source license. And I didn't pay them to uh, do that as a teaser for my talk, by the way. <laughs> Akka has been around for over uh, a decade. Uh, it's a very popular toolkit. Uh, many use that uh, toolkit in their code, in their programs, in their products. Now, imagine what it feels like. Last week. In my company, we've experienced uh, something similar twice over the past couple of years with different projects. It was a painful uh, and an insightful experience. Uh, and I'd like to use this talk to share with you uh, some of that, uh, these insights and look into these uh, cases when your uh, open source turns to the dark side. <laughs> I'm Dotan Horvitz. I'm the principal developer advocate at logs.io. At logs.io, we provide Cloud Native Observability uh, platform that's based on popular open source tools. So this topic is very relevant for us, as you'll soon see. I'm an advocate of open source and communities in general, and uh, the CNCF in particular. I co-organize the local CNCF chapter in Tel Aviv, where I'm based. I also have a podcast called Open Observability Talks about open source based observability. You're all welcome to check it out in your favorite podcast app. And uh, uh, as you probably have noticed, I'm uh, a bit of a Star Wars geek. Uh, so uh, funny anecdote from last week, I was invited to uh, speak at uh, Container Days. Someone was even there to uh, see. And I was surprised, amazed to see how many Star Wars Lego kits were uh, uh, handed out there in the, in the booth. So uh, may the open source be with you. <laughs> and let's start with our experience from last year. So it was the beginning of 2021, um, second week of January, everyone coming back from the, from the New Year's um, vacations, starting the year, and then a bomb dropped on us. On January 14th, 2021, Elastic NV released, released this announcement that it's changing the uh, license of Elasticsearch and Kibana from Apache 2.0 to a dual license, SSPL and Elastic license. And not only that, it's going to be taking effect immediately. Uh, naming back then, it was, the latest was 7.10. Uh, 7.11 was due uh, a couple of weeks later. It would already be with a new license. Uh, for those who don't know, who are not familiar, uh, the ELK stack, or ELK, is um, a very popular stack for search and for log analytics. Uh, it's been around for over a decade. Uh, it's based on Apache Lucene. Elasticsearch is essentially the database. Then Kibana is the visualization. And then there's Logstash, Filebit, and other tools and libraries for ingestion and instrumentation, all of which used to be Apache 2.0 until that point. As I mentioned, I work for logs.io and we provide uh, an observability platform that's based on uh, open source tools such as Prometheus, Jaeger, and also Elasticsearch and Kibana. So for us, Elasticsearch is at the core of our system. It's a critical system, critical component, uh, and we've been investing uh, in tweaking and optimizing it for our use case for years. 
So you can only imagine what, it, uh, what the confusion that this announcement caused us. And in fact, it was a bit even more confusing because the title of that announcement that I mentioned was doubling down on open. And the announcement itself talked about, as you can see here, this license change ensures our community and customers have free and open access to modify, redistribute, collaborate on the code. Free and open, to distribute, collaborate. Sound, sounds a bit like free and open source software, right? Uh, maybe it's not such, uh, such bad news. Maybe, maybe SSPL is open source. And we weren't the only ones confused by that. Um, actually, shortly after the announcement, because of that, uh, the OSI released a special uh, uh, notification announcing and declaring that the SSPL is not an open source license. It does not comply with the open source definition. It discriminates against specific fields of endeavor uh, and essentially describing it as Foxpen license. And that's, by the way, very important. Open so source available is not open source. It's Foxpen source license. So, as you might imagine, lots of shock and confusion, not by us, by the entire community. Uh, lots of uh, turmoil, many posts, social media, blogs, uh, articles, uh, doubling down on open is not open at all. Uh, Elasticsearch and Kaban are now business risks. Uh, Elastic promises open but delivers proprietary, uh, even angry bunny rabbits, which is really spooky. <laughs> so um, that was the sentiment at the time. And shortly after, uh, people started uh, calling to fork the project to keep it open source, to keep it Apache 2.0. And uh, I'm glad to say that uh, we at Logs.io uh, said that immediately out loud came, uh, came out with this uh, very clear message that we're uh, uh, in favor of forking and we'll do everything we can to, uh, to do such a forking effort. And the far greater uh, player in the market, AWS, we have a member here that uh, is prominent from AWS, he can testify, uh, decided to step up and uh, make this fork happen. Uh, the sentiment, it was very clear, people indicated that they would prefer such fork over uh, an SSPL, elastic SSPL version, and that as soon as such a fork is avail be made available, they would switch from Elasticsearch to that new fork. So what happened with the uh, relicensing? What, what did the community do? What did we do? I'll back to that very soon. But first, let's talk about what is open source anyway? We all, know, we all know open source licensing, BSL, Apache, GNU, uh, MIT, uh, lots of material about that and discussions here in these uh, forums. However, is open source software licensing enough? What prevents the project from changing license? And very importantly, who? can change the license. The OSI has a slogan on its website that I, I really love, guaranteeing the hour in source. So following the same vein, ask yourselves, who is the hour in source? Who governs the open source project? And essentially, there are three uh, main categories for that. The first one is open source uh, by individual maintainers. Free maintainers, open source maintainers, enthusiasts doing it on their own free time. Uh, actually, that's the vast majority of projects out there on GitHub, and largely even just one or two maintainers behind uh, the project. Uh, here you see a couple of uh, very high profile ones, like Curl, that is deployed on millions of devices, from your washing machine to your car, single maintainer. Uh, Log4j, we all remember Log4Shell from uh, less than a year ago and uh, the extent of its, uh, its reach. Uh, I think 10th of Maven Central was somehow dependent on this vulnerability, two maintainers. So I think um, this is very clear. This is the first category. The second category is open source backed by vendors. 
we saw Elasticsearch and Kibana. We can talk about Grafana, MongoDB, Akka that we just mentioned relicensed last week. Uh, that's the second category. And the third, we're here at the Open Source Summit by the Linux Foundation, an excellent example. And obviously, uh, all the affiliate uh, foundations, the CNCF, the CDF, uh, and, and so on. Uh, excellent examples. And unlike maybe the other categories here, there's more diversification. It's multi-vendor, multi-entity. Uh, so there's vendor neutrality in many senses of the, uh, of the world uh, to a greater extent. So th these are the options for uh, who can govern the project. And why is that important? You'll soon see. Now let's look at some uh, cases, case studies of open source turning to the dark side. And we'll start with the case of open source turning, going non-open source. And let's go back to the Elasticsearch uh, example case study that we started talking about. We saw the uh, announcement relicensing Elasticsearch and Kibana. Um, and uh, by the way, Elastic uh, NV uh, said that it did that to fight off competitors, primarily AWS that had, uh, it was very big and had the commercial offering based on that open source. And uh, while Elastic felt that they were the ones doing all the heavy lifting. That was the reasoning behind it. Uh, and just to put it in frame, Elastic NV itself is not a small company. It's a publicly traded company, uh, around the $8 billion market cap or so. Um, that's that's uh, it. Um, but the problem is that it didn't end there. The rest of the Elk stack that we mentioned before uh, remained Apache 2.0. But then uh, they started introducing breaking changes to the components to make sure that they comply uh, with the uh, Elastic's official distro, that they work with a, an official distro. So just for an example, there's a, for example, Filebit. It's an agent that can read uh, logs off of a local log file and then send them to a remote Elasticsearch cluster. Um, and it stayed Apache 2.0, but then there was a piece of code that checked that if the remote Elasticsearch is uh, not official or not certified, it would, it would not work. So many people upgraded the file bit, for instance, suddenly it stopped working for them. For other distros, but also, by the way, for older versions of the open source. So if you still ran open, uh, Elasticsearch version 7.10 or older, it would stop working for you as well with the open source. So it happened with file bit, with other bits, with uh, Logstash, with client libraries that are used for instrumenting your source code. Uh, and every other day, you'd hear another user, another developer that upgraded and st started, stopped working for him or her, and uh, they started digging into the code or documentation, fi finding these things, uh, pieces of code, and, and uh, obviously being raged by this uh, uh, thing. I think the best description for those who don't know Elasticsearch uh, is this tweet that gives the analogy from uh, relational databases. Can you imagine the reaction to Oracle's MySQL uh, a team if they had decided to fix MySQL client libraries so they could only connect to an official MySQL version. So that's, that's it. And as I mentioned, the community called to fork uh, the project, created the fork. The fork was brand named OpenSearch. Uh, it was led by AWS uh, together with uh, Red Hat, SAP, Capital One, and my company, Logs.io. And you'd say, OK, what's the big deal? Just hit the fork button from the Apache 2.0 version, and that's it, right? That's what open source is, open source is meant to, to be. But then we discovered that it wasn't that simple by any means. That's, by the way, a summary from the uh, community call on the project uh, effort. And uh, as you can see here, the engineers that went in to uh, do the forking discovered that both Elasticsearch and Kibana projects were uh, entangled between the Apache 2.0 code base and the proprietary XPAC code base. Um, so they needed to separate it uh, one from another, sometimes even line by line traversal. It was uh, uh, not exactly the fork it uh, uh, experience that you'd, you'd uh, imagine. Uh, and inside, there were also uh, other things that they found, like uh, dial home features, telemetry that was collected, some branding elements. So things were very uh, uh, entangled there between the open source and non-open source and elastic proprietary things. 
Uh, and if you want to hear more about that, first of all, we have here uh, my distinguished gentleman, Kyle, here. But also, we had an episode on Open Observability Talks podcast. You're more than welcome to check out the episode, uh, relaying beautifully all this journey and great effort that was made to uh, make this fork happen. Uh, an amazing experience. And uh, gladly, half a year later, July 2021, uh, the fork uh, reached uh, 1.0, open search. Uh, reached the uh, general availability, uh, and shortly after, uh, many sorry many started uh, moving to using that, including some big names such as uh, Dow Jones, Goldman Sachs, Pinterest, SAP, Zoom, Rackspace. Obviously, Amazon uh, moved there uh, to use it. Uh, uh, Logs.io moved to use that. So that's the story with Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch was the example of an open source going to a non-OSI license, a non-open source license. But remember what I said at the beginning. Open source is more than just a license. And things can happen also within the OSI licensing realm. For example, going copyleft. And I'd like to look into the case study of Grafana. Grafana is a... Um, a uh, very popular open source tool for uh, uh, metrics dashboarding and monitoring. It's Apache 2.0. It's backed by Grafana Labs, uh, which also offers Loki and Tempo, other projects. And in April 2021, last year, Grafana Labs released an announcement that it's relicensing Grafana, Loki, and Tempo from Apache 2.0 to GNU AGPL version 3. And by the way, Grafana explained it by needing to balance the open source uh, community needs with their commercial, uh, Grafana Labs commercial needs. Uh, something like that that essentially comes down to, again, uh, uh, fighting off competitors using the, the open source project. AGPL is an OSI approved license that meets all the criteria of free and open source software. So what's the problem, right? So the problem is that there's a new reality. People woke up to realize that the open source tool that they use has suddenly become infectious. It was an, a copyleft license. For example, uh, Google, in its official open source policy, bans use of AGPL, uh, saying very clearly that the risks heavily overweigh uh, the, the benefit. And it's not just for them. It's for many others, the case for many others. So wh why is that uh, such a risk? And what, what is that copyleft uh, anyway? Uh, so without uh, going into the uh, legal uh, talk, I'm not, I'm not a lawyer, by the way. So uh, bear in mind, as an engineer, putting it very plainly, Using AGPL software with uh, uh, modifications requires that anything it links to must also be licensed under AGPL. So it spreads effectively virally in this case. And um, so it means that if you modify the code, you're at risk of license contamination. And actually, even if you uh, link to it like a DLL, you may also be at risk uh, in some cases. But even more so, uh, this is triggered if the AGPL software is interacted with through a computer network. That's section 13 of the license, uh, which effectively uh, means that uh, if you think about it, uh, you don't have to actually package a product and ship it to be liable. Anyone contacting, uh, connecting to it, it's already uh, valid. So think about uh, Google or any other SaaS company. The actual product is a service that users interact with through the, or via the internet, that makes AGPL a very problematic license business-wise to SaaS model. Uh, but, but just one note, even if you just use that for internal use only, okay, let's say that you don't expose anything, even then it might be tricky, this viral effect, because let's say that you have I don't know, vendors working for you, uh, contractors, uh, temporary employees, something like that. 
from the licensing perspective, a user is a user. There's no distinction between internal and external. And you might find yourself needing to expose source code or things that you didn't, hadn't planned on, on, on exposing. So it, definitely check it out, even if you just use that internally. It's, uh, it could be quite infectious. Um, but we're here at the Open Source Summit, and it's important to say it's not only problematic for vendors like Google and others. It's also problematic for the, the open source community itself in some cases because of the license contamination. If I'm a project that wants to be Apache 2.0, that's my decision. I definitely do not want to be imposed by another license because of a tool or a library that I use. And that's actually what happened uh, with uh, Grafana. It's widely used by, by quite a bit of projects under the CNCF. And after Grafana's announcement, the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, released a very clear clarification saying that if you use an AGPL, they didn't name Grafana. It's a general guideline, of course, for AGPL. It's an open source, but it's very problematic. And because of that, and you can read the problematic part, but the, the guideline that they provided, the directive, switch to an alternative component or freeze the component at the version prior to the relicensing. Do not, please do not upgrade to the relicensed version or ask for an exception. That's the guidance that the CNCF released to its projects. So we saw examples of Elastic NV and Grafana Labs, but it can happen not just with vendors, which brings me to uh, the third case study, um, a case study of two po very popular NPM packages, uh, Colors and Faker. Both of them MIT licensed, uh, a very permissive license, I'm sure you all agree. Um, and both maintained by Morak Squares, um, an individual, a single open source maintainer, doing it on his own time, on his own uh, free will. And earlier this year, this year, January 5th, 2022, Morak deleted the entire code base of Faker and released a new version to NPM, a new package, 666. Now, I, I found it a bit ironic that the logo for Faker is this uh, magician's hat and then uh, poof, <laughs> disappeared. But jokes aside, Faker had around 2 million downloads weekly in addition to many, many other projects, JavaScript, Node.js, that uh, had dependencies on this project. So just imagine that poor uh, guy, Falk, that uh, upgraded automatically to the latest update, uh, and what happened? Uh, to his defense, uh, Morak gave a heads up a couple of months earlier in an issue on GitHub. Uh, you can read here, but essentially, no more free work for me. Uh, I'm no longer going to support Fortune 500s. Uh, it's plainly pay me or fork it. But it didn't end up with Faker. Three days later, on January 8th, 2022, he released uh, a version of the colors package, the other package, with uh, essentially a, a malicious code, uh, an infinite loop, that essentially turned uh, uh, any Node.js server using it into a DDoS, so the denial of service uh, 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 situation. And Colors is even more popular than Faker. It has like 20 million downloads weekly and has like other 4 million uh, projects on GitHub dependent on it in one way or another. So obviously, immediately after this release, it created the ripple effect. Many projects went down, uh, were broken, including some very high, uh, high profile ones. The, the AWS CDK is a, is a great example, the uh, cloud uh, development kit, until uh, NPM rolled back the rogue release and, and uh, stopped this, this uh, uh, from getting worse. Mark released this uh, blog post uh, uh, say, titled Monetizing uh, Open Source uh, is Problematic, which I think puts it very plainly why he did this, uh, find it need to put these extreme measures in place. So that's the case for uh, open source going rogue. 
We saw case studies in the past year or so, so not even going too far back, of open source going non-open source, open source going copyleft, open source going rogue. But what can we learn from these cases? So I would like to go over uh, some learnings for, uh, for building open source, for using open source, and for vetting new open source for your organization. First, if you're building open source, remember this. Open source is not a business model. If you're building or considering to build an open source, please take one thing. If you're taking one thing out of this talk, please take this. Open source is not a business model. Uh, the problem is not with the uh, commercial vendors, as we've seen. It's with the commercial incentive, okay? So if you're a maintainer, if you're a vendor, sorry, and if you choose to go down the open source path, you should have a sustainable model in place. Uh, if you don't, uh, you will end up in conflicts between the open source community needs and your business ones, and you'll end up doing things such as relicensing uh, defensively and uh, pulling the rights ratchet on your users, uh, as it's uh, sometimes called, uh, not to mention also essentially ripping off the community members that actually contributed their code and time uh, into the project, which is another problem with the CLA, the, uh, the Contributor License Agreement versus the DCOs and others. I'm not going to open this discussion, but definitely the, uh, an important discussion to have in the OSPO forums. So that's for vendors. And if you're a maintainer, and if you decide to open source your project, um, please, do not expect material compensation. Yes, even if all the Fortune 500s are going to benefit from your project. There are enough opportunities out there to get paid for uh, development, for coding. Uh, by the way, even for developing on top of open source as an employee by companies. But this is not the way, open sourcing a project. And of course, if, if you do want to monetize your project, you can build a vendor entity around the project and offer uh, uh, services around it. You can see the examples of, uh, of uh, Chronosphere for M3 or Confluent for Kafka or others. And if you go down this path, of course, remember my advice for, for vendors before. So that's for building open source. If you're using open source, here are a few uh, uh, best practices on how to keep safe. First, manage your third-party licensing exposure. Same way you manage your security exposure. So prefer uh, least restrictive licenses that meet your needs. Uh, look for license contamination. If you work with S-bombs, we had quite a bit of talks about S-bombs and do use them not just for the security, but also for mapping the components and their respective licenses and, and uh, map that. Uh, Manage your third-party licensing. Next, take care with automation. Uh, put in place uh, license compliance checks before updating third-party uh, components. Uh, don't do auto-updates without safeguards in your CI-CD pipeline or whichever automation you have in place. Also, code smells in the open source can signal uh, something is wrong there. Um, and that can buy you time to act proactively rather than reactively. Uh, remember the examples we gave before uh, with things such as entangled code, uh, some dial home features, things such as that. Uh, obviously, uh, code smells require you to have some familiarity with the source code of the project. Not everyone have that, but it's not infrequent that uh, uh, more uh, heavy users of an open source go in whether to modify or to just understand how it works better. So when you go in, keep your nose open for, for code smells. Um, and lastly, if you do find yourself needing to uh, tweak the open source to suit your needs, please prefer uh, extending the open source functionality with plugins over downstream modifications. Or if you can, uh, do contribute them upstream. And the reason behind that is that vendors blocking plugins is less common uh, than blocking code modification via relicensing. 
So that's for, for using open source. And if you're vetting a new open source for your company, your project, uh, here are a few uh, uh, things to consider beyond the standard thing that you, you already have in place. First, the obvious, which open source license. And remember, not all the OSI licenses are born equal. For example, the copyleft licenses. Uh, and also remember, source available is not open source. Also ask yourselves and check who's behind the open source. Is that a single maintainer? Whether by the maintainer or a vendor, just a single entity is a single point of failure. Be careful of that. Uh, if it's a vendor, remember, it, it, it may pull the, the rug from underneath the feet. It can, uh, uh, you can find yourself in the, the rights ratchet situation there. Uh, and obviously, from that uh, respect, foundational open source is the preferred way. In that case, it provides more diversification of the entities as much as uh, it can. It also has its risks, of course, but important. Also, ask yourselves, who, what is the governance policy? Um, what do they how do they ensure that no single entity grabs control? Uh, what's the promotion path to contributor, to maintainer, who can review PRs, who can uh, approve PRs, uh, who can ultimately <laughs> uh, perform such relicensing? Um, and again, here, uh, foundations help by facilitating the governance and providing uh, oversight on, on that respect, so uh, a, a good advantage there as well. And lastly, if you uh, do have these problems in uh, great concern, you can consider vendor distros or, or uh, uh, some uh, SaaS offering that over the open source that can shield you from th some of this. So distro is, is essentially a packaging of the upstream open source delivered by a vendor, but it's delivered with indemnification, uh, along with some support, some, uh, some uh, hardware uh, uh, certification if you run it on-prem or uh, if you run on the cloud, it could be as a, as a SaaS model. Uh, and on the way, you can also fund, help fund the open source because many of the contributors to these projects are actually these uh, uh, companies and vendors that provide the distros or the services around the open source. So that's for vetting a new open source. Now let's summarize what we've seen. Open source is more than a license. As we've seen, open source can turn to the dark side in many ways. It can be relicensed, it can go rogue, uh, or otherwise pull the rug from underneath your feet. Uh, it can happen to veteran projects over a decade old. It can happen any time. Remember Akka just last week? So beware of this bait and switch stunt. Uh, for me, it's a personal concern to see the, this rice ratchet model uh, spreading. I actually wrote a blog post about that uh, over a year ago. You can see here, I called it, is vendor owned open source an oxymoron? Uh, you're welcome to check it out with your QR code. Uh, and to summarize, what are the best practices? So first select open source wisely. Uh, check which license uh, it is. Uh, who's behind the project, with what governance policy is in place behind the project. Also, use the open source wisely. Manage the licensing exposure. Don't auto-update without safeguards. Uh, beware of code smells, and so on. And last but not least, build open source wisely. And again, remember, open source is not a business model. My great concern is that people lose, start losing trust in the open source uh, over these uh, vendors' uh, uh, activities. So always ask yourselves, who's, who's the hour in source for the project that you're looking into? I'm Dotan Horvitz. Thank you very much for listening. And may the open source be with you. And I believe we have a bit of time for questions, so glad to uh, answer any questions that uh, people have here. No question. Yes, please. I don't have a question, I have a comment. Just a second. We need a microphone for that. Uh, or you can repeat the question. Or, or I'll repeat the question. I thought there was a microphone. Say, please. Uh, 
mentioned that blog about IO, your company used like it for ages. So basically what happened is that Elasticsearch put a lot of money into the product and you use it for free. And as far as I understand, but perhaps I'm wrong, it all started because somebody, another entity, wanted to use Elastic for free, get all the benefits, and pay nothing. That you forgot to mention. Okay, let, let me read the question for the audience and then I can answer. So we asked why Elastic uh, NV, the vendor, decided to do the relicensing, the reasoning behind it. Uh, and he also asked as a follow-up question, if people use the, the open source without uh, paying anything. Uh, that's, uh, in summary, it was a long phrasing. So I hope that I summarized uh, 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 shortly. Uh, so first of all, I thought that I explained, but I'm glad to repeat the explanation. As I mentioned, Elastic, and I quoted what Elastic's, uh, Elastic Envy uh, explained itself. Uh, I can't speak on their behalf, but what they explained essentially is that it's, uh, I'm not repeating word to word, but uh, the quote was there, uh, but that they're essentially fighting off uh, or that their competitors making use, I think it's uh, similar to the vein that you said, making use of the project, uh, but uh, Elastic is doing the heavy lifting in contributing to the, uh, and maintaining the, the open source projects. So that was the, the answer to the first it's question, which is, sorry? It's not really a competitor. A cloud provider is not a competitor for a product. Cloud provider is an aggregate of many, many services. It has uh, data streaming, it has a di di database, it has, uh, so it's, it's a conglomerate, but in that specific vertical, they had a, a managed service that provided essentially a managed version of Elasticsearch to, to that. Um, so that was the, and AWS was the biggest threat, obviously, because it's a giant, and they, uh, they mentioned that as part of the reasoning, yes. And for your other question, you said that others use the open source without paying for it. I, I think that's the, the essence of open source. So I don't know how to react to that. We're all in a, this is OSPOCON, uh, so everyone is familiar with the open source model. The model is that you have an open source and everyone is free to use it. The free is not the cost, by the way, the, the, the fact that you don't pay money. The free is the freedom to use it in whichever way uh, shape and form that you uh, make use, including commercial uh, commercial uses. And actually, the fact that it discriminated the, the new license, the SSPL, uh, uh, server-side something license, I forgot the, the initial, the, it was um, discriminating between fields of endeavor was against the open source, the very open source definition. Which so was defined during a time where there were no cloud providers. So the context has changed. And yes, by the, by the word, you are completely right, but I'm not sure because it happened in my previous company, we had the same issue that, yeah, you, you invest a lot of money in, in a product and then somebody says, oh, that's super nice. We pick it up and then we make all the money. So it, it's, in my opinion, a problem of economy, just like the individual contributor. And it's a bit more complex than, oh, you should be careful about open source. You, you get what you saw. So you're opening a whole discussion if you agree with the open source initiative about the open source definition. I'm uh, not going to open that. It's out of scope for, so for this. The talk, you wanted open no, no, I, I'm fine with that. But I'm just saying what I presented was not to challenge the very definition of the open source definition. Open source has a definition. You may say that the open source definition is wrong or it needs adaptation. It's, it's an important definition. But what I presented is... Uh, uh, the alignment with the open source definitions as they are. And this, at least, and we, I showed also the OSI's specific announcement. It said, this, is, this does not comply with the open source definition. It's not open source software. If we need to change and maybe invent more licenses, it's fine. My personal opinion here, and that, that is, I, I didn't go into that here, but uh, I, I'm glad to say, I think that extending the definition of open source to say open source is also the business model is, is wrong. Uh, someone gave the analogy of, uh, uh, how, how do you say that? Someone t tells you um, the sale of, of uh, oranges went down 60% and said, uh, okay, let's extend the uh, definition of an orange uh, to pears and, and uh, I don't know, grapes, and then we'll get better. So it, it's the same vein. You say open source will, not be, will also be some sort of commercial licensing and then we'll have more adoption of open source by, no, open source is open source by the very idea that you put something out there and uh, people use that to whichever need 
uh, they have. And let's remember, these vendors became successful because it was open source. So they, pu they pulled people in to use, people that might not have used them. I see that actually from the discussions after Akka's discussion. I followed discussions on Reddit and others. People said we would never have chosen Akka had it not been open source. So it was a great funnel for them uh, to reach that point. So a bait and switch where you say, I'm open source, come use me. And after you then, then start tightening the uh, ratchet on the, on the licensing, I don't know, for me personally, but that's already beyond the, the facts, that's my personal opinion, I don't think that's the purpose of open source. New licensing models, I actually had a discussion with uh, Stefano, the managing director of the uh, OSI about that. I think we need to cater for more uh, uh, licensing options. There, are, there is a variety of licensing models within the OSI realm to cater for several uh, models. I suggested uh, choosing the right model. Uh, I would say also educating more about uh, building sustainable business models is very, very important. Uh, but again, that's a, a whole <laughs> talk on its own about how to build a sustainable business model around that. Um, I hope that I answered the question. Uh, any other questions? Anyway, so thank you very much for uh, listening. Uh, you can find me tomorrow. I'll be at the CNCF booth uh, at the exhibition hall. If you have any questions, I'll be around uh, uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, or just reach out to me at Horowitz on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, Quora, uh, uh, WordPress, whichever medium you want. Uh, I'd be happy to uh, follow up with uh, questions. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>